far as the presentation today, it's my views, uh, and I'm not providing any consulting advice. It's not the views of the chamber or of Shaw, because uh, every, every situation varies. So consequently, if, if any scenario arises that you do need advice or guidance on, please ensure that you obtain the proper and appropriate uh, guidance, whether it be legal accounting or forensic accounting. Well, one thing about theft and fraud experience is that when you, if you've ever had a fraud experience uh, where someone has taken from you, you've been defrauded, it's very personal. You can, it, it gets into your gut and you feel you've been deprived and frequently you feel be, uh, betrayed. And I think I learned that at, uh, very young because I was brought up in a family business. I can remember one night my father suddenly rushed out at night because he had gotten a call that one of his managers was at the back of one of his stores loading up his truck. And the next morning, my father was at breakfast and he was totally devastated. So you have that experience of fraud. It can have not just a financial impact, but as we can see, the dollar impact. Not guilty, but we also have to look at the other side of it, is that some people are falsely accused of fraud. And when that occurs, it's devastated to them, they feel betrayed. Not only that, is that you could end up in a lawsuit. Uh, so you have to be very careful from both angles. So, so fraud risk management is where we're coming from today, is that it does not just involve in protecting your assets, it also involves ensuring that you take the right and correct steps so you are lessening your chance of being sued, and as well as that you don't result in loss of, loss of evidence. Because you don't go about it the right way, you collect your evidence incorrectly, the court may throw it out, and consequently you thought you had a case, you don't, all because of the way you went about it. So my, uh, today what we're basically going to cover is what, what the objective is. We're going to go through various uh, impacts of fraud it has upon small business, as well as why it's difficult for small businesses to address fraud. Because there's a particular scenario uh, with small businesses versus a larger business. And the types of frauds that small businesses uh, can be exposed to, as well as to react in a positive, proactive manner. So one thing I'm going to make it clear, I don't want you to leave this room today thinking that someone's stealing from you, that everybody is thieving from you, that, that you are fear, 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 because that's not the case. <laughs> is the whole case is, is because I don't know if you've ever worked in an environment of fear. Uh, it's the worst environment you can work in. Because a number of years ago when I was young, was that I did have such a situation where I was in this company and the owner. First day you were hired, I trust nobody, everyone's stealing from me, blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to catch you and I'll prosecute you. And, and consequently, you only worked there because you couldn't find another job or you were hoping to find another job. He paid lower wages than, uh, than everybody else and, and you're forever seeking another opportunity. And so don't rule by fear. And I think with fraud risk management, the whole, that's one of the underlying uh, foundations of it is that you create an environment where you don't have to rule by fear. Uh, because if you rule by fear, I do feel it does impact your productivity as well as keeping and maintaining good staff because staff is your valuable asset. So my objective is to create awareness. So you can be proactive in dealing with uh, the fraud environment, so you can be blended in with your company so, so to improve your productivity. And it has to be done in a way that doesn't alienate your staff, it doesn't alienate your, your vendors, your suppliers, your customers, uh, and also cost effective. Because I'm not one of those that say, gee, you've got a problem, uh, give me 100 grand to save 20,000. And many years ago, not that many, but when, I guess about 10 years ago, forensic accounting suddenly became very big and everyone wanted for, for forensic accounting. And suddenly a few people suddenly realized, gee, we're spending a million dollars to save a hundred. So it's important to be cost effective in, um, in the progress. And so basically, out of today, understand the importance of doing your homework so that you can manage effectively. The impact. Well, I'm sure that every now and then, sometimes far too often, 
you open up the newspaper and you see someone's been accused of fraud, someone's been thrown in jail for fraud. It could be with a small business, it could be the bookkeeper, it could be someone who works with the government. So, and also statistically, if we look at it from, from a statistics perspective, the ACFE, which is the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, um, they do a biannual survey about uh, report to the nations of all their members and victim organizations with staff of, 100, of under 100, which is small business, their loss is $150,000 medium based upon the survey. For some reason, Canadian companies came out at 200000 I don't know if that's because of the fact that Canadian crooks are smarter or because of the fact that uh, our economy is much better than, than, than the U.S. right now. Uh, and then as well as of all the uh, frauds that, that were reported in the survey, approximately 31% were in respect to the small companies. But to me, we can look at st statistics all day. What's more important about the fraud in a small business is the impact, those, those, those non-tangible personal impacts that it has. As I noted before, it's a gut-wrenching experience as well as you face concerns from your customers and from your suppliers. Yet one of your creditors suddenly sees your name in the newspaper, you had a fraud of $200,000. They say, my goodness, how is ranking going to stay in business? And they call you and say, my wonder you're 45, 60 days behind. I want my money. So it can have those types of consequences. Plus two, I think you have to remember when you have a loss, it's right off the top. So if you have a $100,000 loss and your margin is only 10%, doesn't take a genius to figure out that you have to sell a million dollars to make that up. And that's an awful lot of work, especially if you're in a small business. And I think more importantly, though, is the time, the, the, the distraction. I know the first time when I reported someone for theft, the police came, had to fill out reports, I had to go to court, he got a lawyer, I got a lawyer, we, and, it just, and then the court date came, he was convicted. But, and at the end of it, I say, well, gee, it took so much time. So you have that time that's involved and you get, uh, can get sidetracked from your business. So despite all, all the statistics and, and, and the knowledge of fraud, why is it that small business owners are, from my experience, reluctant to address, uh, to address fraud risk? Well, I really think it comes down to is that one, is that in, in a small business, as I said, you've got other priorities. And also, more importantly, is that it's a feeling of trust, is that you want to trust. We're, we're, we're human beings. You know, you, you trust your kids, you tr trust your spouse, you trust your employees. And, and, and in a small business, it becomes like a family. I, I you know if you ever, um, you know, I mean, working in the small business, you just, feel you, sometimes you spend more time with them than you do with your family. So it's only natural that you do develop a bond of trust. And another reason is lack of expertise. You may know, be aware of the risk, but you don't really know what the signs are. You don't know how to, how to deal with it appropriately without getting people upset. And of course, you have your priorities. And I think that when you look at what it's like to be within a small business environment, which many of you are aware of, is that there you are in your business. It could be an office, it could be a retail shop, uh, and it could be even a construction company or you're just driving bulldozers and you've got a number of people working with you. But you're there. You have limited resources. You may have an accountant but you don't call them too often because you're afraid, afraid, afraid of the bill. You, you, you've got a lawyer. Again, you're also afraid of maybe even a bigger bill. Uh, and then you have your staff. Always you think you understaff. They may not have the appropriate expertise. And of course, you've got financing, but it could be limited. So there you are in the middle of the small business with limited resources and what pressures, and which I call interacting forces, that are pounding at you. You've got creditors demanding money. By the same time, the creditor accountant is calling de demanding money. Their salesman has got the next great product that he's trying to sell $100,000 to you to. Then you've got your staff. They want certain days off. They may want more wages. So you've got all these 
pressures which, 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 which are in your face, and they remind you of them. But underneath all this, what do you have? You have fraud risk. It's silent. The risk is a risk. It may not be there. Maybe no chance of fraud at all. It may not be occurring, but it could be occurring. But it's silent. Unlike all the other pressures that, that, that you have, the staff, the, the budget limitations, it's not in your face. It's silent. So I think that that's why it's so special about the small business is the environment, is that because of that environment, you may not uh, deal with it because you've got other priorities. If it doesn't m make a noise, why worry about it? And then when it makes a noise, it's pretty loud though. It can devastate your business. And that's why you've got to be aware of it. <laughs>